Um, I'm happy to tell you that at the artist and arts organization meeting yesterday, we had 46, I think. And last night, Amy counted, and she tells me we had 57 at the public meeting, which I was a little curious how that was going to go, because there were no RSVPs for that meeting. So you have no way of guessing what's going to happen. And we packed the room, and we packed the room with positive energy. It was just great. So um, here we are, the business and civic leaders. Um, Wendy, Anisha, and Anna from ArtSpace are going to take over and lead the meeting. And um, there's some presentation and then some participation. So, oh, and um, the microphone, if you are speaking, we're going to pass the microphone around. It's for the benefit of the film, not for the PA system. So please cooperate and speak into the mic when you're asked to. Hi, I'm Wendy Holmes. and. Uh, this is my third day in Grand Marais, though I've been coming here since I was 13 years old uh, when my sister moved to Thunder Bay, Ontario. So uh, I feel very familiar with the place, and yet the last couple of days we've learned so much about your community and all you have to offer, particularly in the arts and the creative sector. So we're thrilled to be able to see Grand Marais in new light. Anisha's never been here. Mm -hmm. This is maybe the furthest north she's ever been. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Okay. <laughs> and Anna is a Minnesota <clears throat> native and has been coming up here, right, for a while? Yeah. So, um, but we're, none of us are experts on Grand Marais, but there's a familiarity here that we're very comfortable with. So it's nice to be working in our own state. So let's first of all go around and introduce yourselves. Many of you, especially in smaller communities, wear multiple hats, and so we'd like to know those hats that you wear. You don't have to say every single hat, but ones that might be the more relevant for this conversation would be really good to know. So let's start with you, Howard. Uh, Howard Hedstrom. Oh yeah, I forgot. Okay. Here, let me give you the other one. So that, yeah. 
<clears throat> Howard Hedstrom, uh, president of the EDA, also uh, president of Hedstrom Lumber. Uh, we have a sawmilling firm here. And I'm, I'm locally, I'm on the chamber board and also the Art Colony board. Jerry Grant, I am a member of the Creative Economy Collaborative. I'm on the board of the Playhouse. Karen Blackburn, Director of Cook County Higher Education, and I'm on the Chamber Board. Great. Uh, Dave Mills, and I'm on the City Council. Great, thank you. Heidi Duker, County Commissioner. I'm Jim Boyd. I run the Chamber of Commerce, and I would just like to suggest that Thunder Bay is not a model for any kind of artistic expression. I think it means the city. We'll try to draw lines with our neighbors. Wow. Beth Kennedy, I um, on, on, am on a couple of nonprofit boards, and I'm on a couple of tourism boards, and I own three stores on top. Jill Terrell, I have Joy and Company. We sell for local and regional makers. Um, I have about 120 people that we sell for. We also sell art supplies and uh, try to support local creativity. Nice. I'm Bob Swanson. I'm an alumni of the Blandon Community wow. Leadership um, Foundation and uh, I'm a former board member for the Cook County Historical Society and currently volunteering for the Historical Society. <coughs> Mike Roth, the Graham Ray City Administrator. I'm Craig Wright. I work at North House. Amy Demmer, I work at the Art Colony, and I'm on the Creative Economy Collaborative Committee. <laughs> One, two, too many C's. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a CCC as well. Cook County Commissioner, Jan Sievertson. <laughs> Mike Carlson, Art Colony Board. <laughs> Cheers to Vic, visit Cook County. I'm Carol Mork from the EDA board. Great. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to go through some slides that give you a little bit of background, <clears throat> tell you what we're up to, and then ask you lots of questions. And uh, we may have many more questions for certain people in the room that we have time to cover today, but if we could have a follow-up conversation, I'm thinking of you, Mike, in particular, um, that would be terrific. So we don't have to do that today, but as a follow-up would be great. We want to first thank all the participants that sponsored our visit here. It included many of your arts and cultural organizations, as well as foundations and um, individuals, which is amazing. It's wonderful that so many people have participated to bring art space to your community. So what we're doing right now is called a preliminary feasibility study. And during that study, we do a series of focus groups. We started on uh, yesterday with the first focus group with arts, artists and arts organizations. And then we had a public meeting last night. And now you're the third uh, group meeting. And then we have one after you with business owners in particular and business leaders. Although many of you cross over into all of those categories. And funders and, and, and funding, uh, financing organizations. Sorry, I had the wrong category here. Um, we did area tours both on Tuesday afternoon and yesterday morning and afternoon. So we looked both at the cultural creative assets you already have in your community. And then we looked at potential sites where um, something could be built that would uh, accommodate other kinds of space that you don't currently have in your community for the arts. So that tour was extensive. That's why it took parts of two days, and it was fantastic. And we, we, um, we went out to Hofland, and we saw a lot of sites in Grand Marais, outside of Grand Marais. Um, if you want to know later, Mary can tell you all of those sites. And then we had a public meeting. So that, that's the process that we go through in order to assemble information and make recommendations about what we think might be the next steps in your community. <clears throat> so our space is a nonprofit and we're a nonprofit whose mission is to create, foster and preserve long-term affordability for the creative sector. You can go to the next slide. We were actually founded by the city of Minneapolis in the late 70s when they realized that artists were starting to get priced out of the warehouse district. And nationally, they call that the Soho effect because it happened in New York decades and decades ago. 
Uh, it happens in almost every city. It even happens in rural communities, as you know, that when areas become so hip and cool that others want to be here, then often the locals and the creative people get displaced. And so that really is why we were founded. Even though we work in communities where different situations uh, and different cycles of development are in play, that was our original focus, was to stop that cycle of displacement. So we became a nonprofit real estate developer for the arts to help stop that cycle. And now we own and operate 46 projects in 30 cities and 19 states, um, including Hawaii recently. <laughs> yep. Um, lot, so we have 3.2 million square feet of affordable artist space across the country, and it breaks down into live work spaces, uh, small business, creative enterprise, nonprofit arts organization spaces, and then lots of community space. We learned over time that each of these buildings really needed to have a flexible use community gathering space where the people who were living and working in the building could program that space. So that's what we call community space. It's really flexible use space with lots of wall space <laughs> for exhibitions, but also <clears throat> tall ceilings and, and uh, some light, uh, but also uh, thinking about acoustics for performances as well. So we try to figure out how to make these community spaces as flexible and usable as possible for as many art forms as might be re represented in any given project. So we also do a lot of consulting, which is what we're doing right here. Um, you never know when you start at this point if we will uh, end up having a development relationship or not. And it doesn't really matter to us. What matters to us is listening to the community, figuring out what you need, and providing the techni technical expertise for you to get to that step. So we've consulted on arts districts, on citywide planning in the arts, all kinds of other things. We most recently um, consulted in Duluth with the Art Institute when they were trying to decide whether they wanted to consolidate their spaces uh, because they had space in um, a neighborhood up the hill. Sorry, Lincoln Park. I always have to look at Anna because she led this work <laughs> to come up with the name. Or in the old depot downtown. And then we stole one of their staff members after that. <laughs> but that's another story. <clears throat> she came very willingly. Um, so what we're doing now is a preliminary feasibility study. Uh, often after that, we do an arts market study to look at how many artists and creative people need what kinds of space. This is where you really get into the data and you really understand how many people need what kinds of space, what is their demographic profile? What can they afford to pay? Where are they coming from? Typically, we uh, survey a 50-mile radius, uh, but we want to know if people are uh, coming back to this area that l used to live here. We want to know if they are you know, native to this area, and we want to know <clears throat> how many of those people need what kinds of space. That's okay. And then from there, sometimes we start talking about a specific project. But those are the two key pieces of information that are really needed to understand how to take the next step. So we did an economic impact study, hired an economist uh, from the Humphrey Institute, Ann Markison, and one of her students at the time, Ann Nicodemus. And sh they looked at the benefits of these spaces on individual artists and their families. And I say families a lot because all of these projects that we create are for artists, and most of them have families. Even if they don't have families at the beginning of the time that they lease up a space in these projects over time, we all know artists have children too. So <clears throat> what we learned about the benefits for artists is that artists became more productive, typically didn't have to hold down as many other jobs in order to pursue their creative selves, made more money from their artistic artistic pursuits. That's a big deal. Oftentimes, young artists in particular have to hold down at least another job or two to uh, pursue their creative selves. So this was uh, an important thing for us to understand. And then on the community side, we were often putting properties back on the tax rolls, 
uh, boosting area property values, which can be a double-edged sword depending on the situation. Attracting artists and arts groups and creative businesses. So it's like coffee shops attract coffee shops, artists attract uh, other artists. Anchoring arts districts sometimes that very organically formed as a result of having a critical mass of creative people in a place. Think about, we gave the example last night of Lower Town St. Paul. It's a designated historic district, but everyone thinks about it as an arts district. It's not designated as an arts district, but it's informally known as an arts district. And our, our project in the Northern Warehouse was the first <laughs> project there, or building there, to be occupied by artists. Here's a map of uh, our work across the country, 260 places that we've consulted in the last mm, 13 years, I think. Go ahead. Uh, this is our work in the Twin Cities. Many of you will know these projects. We've done a lot of different things in the Twin Cities that we haven't necessarily replicated in other places. We've done some single family homes for artists. We did a performing arts center. Uh, we have a lot of studio spaces, and we have a fire arts center at 38th in Chicago. The rest of these projects are mixed use, mostly mixed use, live work projects. And then in greater Minnesota, our first project was in Duluth, in the old high school up on the hill. You probably know Washington Studios. And then our second project was in Fergus Falls. And that was really interesting because a group of civic leaders came to us and said, okay, we've raised $460,000, let's go. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> so that was a very unusual situation. <clears throat> they had their eye on restoring this hot old hotel that had been empty downtown and happened to be across the street from a 350 seat uh, active theater. And they really wanted to create a little bit of a hub for the arts and had their eye on that particular uh, particular building, but they also wanted us to see the, um, the old mental health institution <laughs> that's outside of Fergus Falls. Do you all know that place? It's only a million square feet. <laughs> and we said, we think we need to start a little smaller in uh, Fergus Falls. So this has 10 units of live workspace for artists on the upper floors, and then on the first floor there's a, a gallery dedicated to Charlie Beck, if any of you know his woodblock prints. Unfortunately, he died um, a year or two ago. And then we have music studios and, and classrooms in the lower level. And then in Brainerd, we renovated an old high school. And one wing is live workspace, and one wing is artist um, space for individual studios, for nonprofit arts organizations. There's a woodworking guild. There's a pottery guild. And then most recently in Hastings, Minnesota, we opened up this project. It's on the riverfront. Anna will talk about it a little bit more uh, later, but also it has a mixture of uses. On the ground floor, it's commercial space for the arts, and then above that is the live workspace. So we learned that you've been doing a lot of planning and that in your cultural plan, you outlined four objectives to t tell your story better, to work together, to focus on placemaking <clears throat> and focus on implementation. And so each of these areas has several goals. Uh, in terms of telling your story, you wanted to create an authentic story that, that's true to who you are in this area, in this region. You wanted to develop a marketing and PR plan that helps to support the arts and enhance markets through technology so that artists have better outlets to sell their work and promote their work. And then in terms of working together, you want to, your first goal was to develop a community vision to support the arts and cultural initiatives. I think you've done that. Uh, you want to support collaboration among groups and between groups and support business and economic and professional development as well. So that was another important goal. And then in the placemaking category, which is where we come in, this was your, your number one goal, was to develop affordable workforce housing options for all of your residents, but including your incredible arts community. And then number two, focusing on short-term housing options, also for uh, workers in your community, but especially here in the cultural plan, for your cultural institutions. 
So these two, by the way, came up as number one and t t two, I think. No, number two last night uh, when we surveyed the artists who came to the focus group and we had them write up their priorities of, of uh, different kinds of space that were needed in the community. This was number one, the, work, the workforce housing. Number two was a contemporary art uh, gallery. Number three was artisan residency space and number four was uh, individual studio space. Those, those were the four top priorities that came out of your arts community. So I'm going to turn it over to Anna here to talk about the six components of this project, or not this project, but this uh, process, and then you will have questions for you along the way in each of these categories. So start thinking about that. Thank you. So yes, when we uh, are, are starting uh, to look at, at any new community or new initiative, uh, we always look at it through the lens of these six, six uh, components. And when we're um, working with other groups as well, we s suggest this as a way to start talking about and dividing up uh, the wealth of information um, that, that needs to come together to make a project happen. So we'll start with uh, project concept. We can continue forward. So what 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 is it? What are you trying? What, what's the idea? What are you trying to build? What is needed? Uh, what is wanted? Uh, so, in art space projects, the uh, the concept, uh, as Wendy was describing, has varied over the years for lots of different kinds of space uses. So, I'll give some examples of types of spaces that art space has created uh, to get your ideas uh, going. And it's certainly not an exhaustive list, but some ideas of of what go could go into a project concept for um, what what we're hearing around here. So first is the live workspace, and this is uh, what art space is, uh, is sort of known for developing. Uh, and what we have been talking about along the way is that affordable uh, living space for artists, uh, but also with that additional space within the living unit uh, to, to do work. Uh, so uh, it can be divided up in, in very different ways. So this is an example from Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania, where the artist is a photographer. So you can see that her living area is more over here. She has her backdrop set up on the other side of her apartment um, for musicians or uh, writers. Sometimes you walk into the apartment or the, the living space and you say, well, where? You know, I don't see where the art is made because it's um, either uh, packed away or ha happens at a desk or at a laptop. But the visual artists in particular, you can often see um, their artwork in process. So um, when so I'll just continue to say for a second, live workspace uh, can mean something different, very different to different people. Uh, when we're talking about it for what art space does and what we um, have uh, the, the model that we take on, it's taking a, a creating a living space for artists and then additional 150 to 200 square feet within the living air uh, unit uh, that can be used however the artist wants to do it. When other people have done uh, live workspace, of course, you know, um, there's examples where you know it's kind of retail or workspace below and living above or shared workspaces and, and smaller living units. Um, all of these could be considered live work as well. Community space, um, this is uh, a big part of what uh, art space projects include, but we, it also, in, in other projects, is, is that flexible, multi-use, mixed-use space uh, that can be um, programmed by you know, the artists, the community members, uh, can be gatherings, uh, performances, uh, outdoor, indoor, gallery, uh, plenty of uh, different ways that these community sort of creative spaces can be used. Artist in residency, this could uh, either be on the uh, living side or on the working side, so temporary space for visiting artists. And this is something that's come up um, quite frequently uh, as, as we've been here, as, and Wendy said, came out in the artist meeting quite loudly that there is a need for space for visiting artists and instructors and experts as they come to town. So that could be uh, living space, temporary living space uh, and or temporary working space for visiting artists. Creative workspace, this is a, a broad umbrella term to mean space that nobody lives in, uh, but is, is um, purely dedicated to the, the work of one individual or one group, uh, usually. So it'd be sort of rented by an artist to do their artwork or to rehearse uh, um, or, or give classes. Uh, it can be more on the craft side or the small business side. Um, uh, or you know, more digital um, and graphic design work can happen. Um, and all, uh, all of these can happen in this type of space, art studio space. Uh, 
Collaborative space, again, an umbrella term that would include maker space, co-working space, uh, the Fab Lab concepts. As a couple examples, this is the Chicago Avenue Fire Arts Center in Minneapolis uh, on 38th in Chicago uh, in an, uh, in an uh, historic silent movie theater. Uh, this is a group of fire artists who came together and wanted to create a community space on this intersection, which was sort of a rough intersection in South Minneapolis. Uh, uh, and they, as blacksmiths, fire artists, glass slumpers, wanted a place to do their artwork uh, that in, a, in a safe and community space, uh, but also to do a lot of education. So in this building, they have classes uh, almost daily, uh, but they also uh, have um, memberships available for artists who are of a level that they can work independently, uh, and they can pay monthly membership dues and have access to all the equipment that they wouldn't otherwise necessarily be able to afford to have in their own home or it wouldn't be uh, safe uh, to necessarily have in your home for the fire artists. Uh, this is another newer example uh, in our uh, new project in El Paso, Texas. This is a fab lab, uh, which uh, is more of a maker space, so it has a, a bit more clean cr uh, space for creation, focused on technology um, and, and creating robotics, and has the laser cutters and the 3D printers and so on in that maker space. So shared equipment. Someone said yesterday, um, it's like the YMCA, but for artists. So. Yes, you're not going to buy the treadmill necessarily, but you want a membership. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so retail space, um, just to, to give some examples, because when we say retail, we're not talking about a, you know, having a J. Crew or, or a big box store. We're talking about sm um, small businesses, places for um, uh, sale of art or coffee or uh, art services. Uh, so again, it's something artistic, creative, or um, arts friendly. So we have a uh, bilingual preschool in our Seattle project uh, in the Vietnamese community there. Uh, we have certainly have a um, bike shop, magazine shops, lots of coffee shops, wine bars, things that uh, contribute to um, the, the creative economy. Performance and event space. So of course there's the big theater spaces um, for people to uh, show, uh, see the shows, but all the auxiliary spaces. So uh, dressing rooms, re rehearsal space, classroom space. Uh, um, and this is our example from, from Minneapolis. It's actually a three building performing arts center, the old uh, Masonic Temple, which is also known as the Hennepin Center for the Arts, if you're familiar with that. And uh, the old Schubert Theater that we moved a block and a half to where it now sits forevermore. Um, and the uh, new construction that connects the two and has a, the, the lobby for both. So uh, there's a lot of art uh, administrative space and rehearsal, a uh, black box, couple black box theaters um, and classroom space on, in this building, and then the um, big performance space in the Schubert Theater. All right, so now it's it's your turn. Uh, we uh, have seen a lot of really uh, amazing and beautiful creative spaces in town and in the county, uh, but we want to know, in addition to what is already here, without being duplicative, what other types of spaces, perhaps something like I've shown, or other types of spaces, uh, are needed or wanted uh, here and within Cook County? So this is where you get to just brainstorm as a group. You don't have to wait for the mic. We'll try to catch you, but you don't have to wait for it. Any ideas? And it could be as you know a uh, you know as an audience member. I would really wish that you know there was more places for me to participate in X. There we go. Thank you. This one uh, is kind of ancillary, but I mm -hmm. wanted to mention it to get it up there. <laughs> If we want to have an event in, in uh, Grand Marais that seats 200 people, there isn't a space to do that. We either can go to Grand Portage when they get done fixing mm -hmm. their space or to Lutzen, but there is no spot in Grand Marais where we can have um, a, a big gathering unless we rent a tent, as uh, some <laughs> folks do. The other thing I would like to point out is, <laughs> is that we, we talk sometimes about having big hair. We talk about having big, hairy ideas, and I, we ought to be encouraged because the Schubert Theater, I remember having to get four million bucks out of the Minneapolis City Council for that, and then going with Art Space to the legislature for four or five years to get bonding. And it was a, a, a huge, hairy, big idea. But look at what they did with it. And so 
maybe not on that scale, but we oughtn't to uh, self-censor. Yes, I love that. So here in this room, <laughs> without self-censoring, let's put some, some ideas for big, big hairy ideas out there. Right now, everything is on the table. Definitely mm -hmm. there's a need for housing, mm -hmm. and we're constantly um, not being able to bring people to Cook County because of housing. Mm -hmm. And so whether it's art artist housing or any housing, housing is a big issue. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. I um, see a need for the temporary housing in mm -hmm. the type of work I do for visiting um, instructors and then for the Grammarie Playhouse for visiting directors. So temporary housing that doesn't have to be in hotels. Mm -hmm. That's great. I'll let you run. Maybe, maybe we should show them the list. Yeah. <coughs> it might be interesting for yeah, I'll show you. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yep, yep. Yeah. For not, yeah. for, so this is um, you know, and when we when we asked this question of the arts and arts organization group, it was like, you know, we spent a good you know 15 minutes hearing all the ideas. So this is the list that they came up with, um, <clears throat> and then we actually had them vote on their top three, of what was most important. So <clears throat> event, event space came up as well, co-working space, gathering space, affordable housing, a space for. Um, like a, a maker space type concept for messy, dirty industrial arts, metal working, woodworking, uh, studio space for more video and, and digital work, uh, sound studio, contemporary art gallery, rehearsal space, uh, clean collaborative workspace for glass work, um, classroom space, clay space with kilns, more venues for performance, fiber arts space with um, gathering space and also storage for looms. Uh, visual art studios, a fab lab with equipment, black box theater, temporary housing. So, of course, a lot of these are um, ideas of, of uses of space that could potentially overlap. So we had a bit of a conversation about that. And then we uh, voted on top three, which came out with four because of the tie, uh, which included affordable housing, contemporary art gallery, art studios, and temporary housing. So black box theater, good question, is um, the sort of a, a term that is kind of a flexible term, but uh, would be a more, if you can imagine this room, higher ceilings and a light grid that is a flexible performance space. Oftentimes they're called black boxes because often the floor, ceiling and walls are all black. Um, so the performance happens on the same level as the audience. Um, it's for more informal, um, smaller productions, sometimes music productions. I'm looking, is there? With seats that can yet come in or, or be flexibly arranged. Yeah. Oh, so this is <laughs> gallery for contemporary art. Yeah. I don't know that that was clarified, actually. It wasn't really. That's what well, I'm not going to let go. Uh, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, my, my interpretation, and we let's talk. But so, as contemporary, it doesn't say this, but contemporary art gallery. So again, it's yeah, the flexibility of English language, what, right? <laughs> so what I mean, and so talk more about what 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 you see. Would you see one side or the other? As well, I've, I've heard um, people speak about needing a place for contemporary art. Mm -hmm. There's one or two landscape paintings around, um, mm -hmm. and yeah. So I was mm -hmm. curious if that's what was intended there or if it was. Uh -huh. And I would offer that um, it could be and probably should be interpreted both ways um, mm -hmm. because there are contemporary artists that want gallery space and there was conversation when we visited the Johnson Heritage Post about the challenges of that as a gallery space. The wall, the ceilings aren't high enough and the light isn't right and the, there's, you know, so the more Contemporary art and contemporary gallery. Contemporary space for space. Art. Yeah. 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 Um, I'd like to flesh out that notion of a gallery in a way. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to see a gallery that can bridge some of the divides in our community. I think that one of the fears of some is that we're leaving the past behind. 
Um, and I don't think that that's the intention of any of us who are kind of advocating for uh, change <coughs> or improvement. So, so that a place that could celebrate the folk art and the history of the fishing community and the lumbering community and um, the Gunflint Trail community, the lodging community, um, as well as displaying uh, the contemporary art that artists are um, developing today, I think would be something that can unify the community around the celebration of what was and what is and an openness to what's to come, if mm. that's possible. Mm. I love that, yeah. Mm -hmm. To piggyback on what Jim said, um, well, m many of the people that we work with have never sold before, mm -hmm. and they're at that beginning of the journey, and that's a magical spot. They would not make it into many of the galleries, but that is um, something I would really like to see encouraged within the community, that you don't have to reach a point where you're going to be juried into some prestigious show to uh, pursue this journey. And um, I, you know, with the kids spaces, with what North House does as well, and the art colony, um, you know, inviting people in to the community, I think is really important because of some of the divisions within the community. People see it as they're getting pushed out of where they grew up because of um, the arts becoming so prominent instead of seeing it as something that works to make a, a stronger, healthier community for all of us. I think we need to be aware of putting it in that context. Mm. I don't know if that mm. makes sense, but. Yeah. Yeah, and that definitely relates to the broader, sort of the broader vision and, and story, tel telling the story of, of, these t of the community and an initiative is it that way. This is great. All right, if you have any other sort of big ideas of, of, of types of spaces that, that the artists uh, group did not bring up, then um, you can bring them up later. Oh, yeah. Hold on, Bob. Hold on. <coughs> Let me um, try not to embarrass myself publicly with my ignorance, but I have uh, <coughs> my logic can be as fuzzy as anyone's. But what about portable spaces? Hmm. Um, and a lot of the the areas, or the, the major metropolitan areas around the country, we have uh, food courts, mm -hmm. you know, uh, food wagons and things like mm -hmm. that. And and people bring their food wagons and they they form these clusters and, mm -hmm. and they're they're because of certain zoning things, they're they're oftentimes temporary. They have to go from location to location. But what about developing uh, something similar for working artists, uh, portable studios, converting a uh, 16-foot uh, travel trailer or office trailer to a gallery space? Um, mm -hmm. There's a there's an art show in Ellensburg, Washington, that's been going on for uh, quite a number of years, 35 or 40 years, and. Uh, to hold this event in Ellensburg on uh, Labor Day weekend, they book an entire hotel for that weekend. Mm -hmm. And the artists come and convert their hotel room to their own personal gallery for the, for the three days. Uh, maybe something like that yeah. could, could work in this, yeah. in this area. Uh, <clears throat> maybe similar to the the crossing borders show there could be uh, 10 rooms at Grand Portage 10 rooms at a at a site here 10 rooms in Lutzen or uh, someplace mm -hmm. and then uh, people could travel up and down the the uh, county mm -hmm. to see this this temporary gallery space yeah these are great ideas we're recording them all down so yeah not to forget jerry. them yes jerry well we have a problem that we have verbalized a few times but you'll notice that pretty much everybody here is from grand marais mm -hmm. um we are trying to do a county-wide effort Mm -hmm. but it is difficult to 
serve the people up the trail, especially given the difficulties of traveling around here in the winter, uh, loots and all these different communities. We want them to be involved. Nevertheless, the focus keeps being Grand Marais and the portable units might help with that if we had a, some kind of a central facility and then a moving gallery mm. or a moving mm. studio or something like that. That could help. Yeah, that's that cool. happened in a cool way. One of our artists was in last night and she just got a $5,000 grant to outfit a gypsy wagon mm. as her painting studio. Oh, cool. Because she doesn't have space in her living space. Uh -huh. um, so it, it's happening. Yeah. From uh, oh, good. Uh, oh, thank you. I was like, oh, we're going to get there. So, <laughs> thank you. They put up a slide that, that typically comes later in the presentation, but just relates to what we're talking about as um, a way that uh, our, our, our arts partners on the Pine Ridge Reservation and us have figured to, to deal with that sort of remoteness and the, the mobile uh, gallery. Um, so, I think. One of you already kind of said this idea. Uh, so this, this is a project that ArtSpace is currently working on. This is a building that's um, still in development. So we've got the renderings and the floor plans. Uh, but right in the geographic center of the Pine Ridge Reservation in uh, Kyle, uh, South Dakota, we're creating this arts incubator uh, in partnership uh, with the uh, First Peoples Fund and, uh, sorry, who's the third? The Lakota Fund, yep. Um, so this will be um, art studios, technical training, uh, computer lab, uh, group studios, uh, private as well as private studios and administrative space for the creative sector uh, on the reservation. Uh, and because Pine Ridge is the size of Connecticut, uh, we know that a lot of, and in the wintertime especially, uh, mobility is challenging. So uh, we've also created the uh, Rolling Res uh, mobile, uh, so this bus uh, travels to each uh, area of the reservation, bringing um, arts training, business training, uh, bringing supplies and materials, uh, and um, and connection with the broader arts community, and then bringing the work back to the center uh, and information back to the the hub. So that's one way that I hear you guys talking about. So there's a couple models out there. So in terms of what this project is, that the rolling res is already up and operating, so they're already um, working while the other, the sort of bricks and mortar project is under development. <clears throat> a community development financial institution that does low interest loans. Hmm. Uh, we have the revolving loan fund, and we gave a loan to an artist a really small loan. For yeah. The through the county. county. Through, through the county. Is, yeah. Is the Foundation. Mm -hmm. I don't think so, but I don't know. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I'm not aware of. We oh, have the entrepreneur, entrepreneur fund. Entrepreneur fund. Low interest rate. Yeah. Well, cool. I, I love these ideas that are starting to, to form. <coughs> All right. Uh, just to continue on with this conversation, uh, and r remember what. Remembering and writing down everything you're saying, so we can come back to that later. So, uh, arts market. So, with uh, any new sort of facility project, uh, we want to know what the market is for using that type of space. So, instead of you know thinking about how much a ticket price is or how much you could sell a painting for, this is really talking about kind of rental market, or or um, sort of buyer's market for space. Continuing on. Uh, 
So the first question is, when we're looking at the arts market, who is an artist? Uh, and we put up this list, and this is just a, a representation of uh, the breadth of, of ways that we um, define artist at Artspace. Uh, we start using creative economy as well, uh, craftspeople and creatives and artists to not limit it to just the fine arts. So culture bearers, certainly graphic designers, folk artists, architects, uh, dancers, fashion designers, arts educators, arts administrators, um, where healing artists came up in our meeting last night as well. Uh, so, you know, all of, all of these plus some, so et cetera, we're continually adding to this sort of list or idea or um, definition of what it means to be an artist. Uh, and we didn't say this when we were going around, but who in, in the many hats that you wear uh, is, is an artist or in a, has a creative hobby or creative pursuit, does something creative. All right, so that's great. Yeah, uh, and what we found with, um, uh, with surveying artists nationwide that most artists uh, don't make their full income through their art. In fact, only about 10% uh, of artists that we've surveyed make 100% of their income through their art. So oftentimes it's uh, holding down other jobs in order to pursue an art career, uh, and of course all the way to the other side of the spectrum where it's people who are um, more uh, hobbyists or do it in their free time. Uh, so arts market, uh, thinking about space now. So what kinds of space do artists need and creatives need in order to do their craft? Uh, so just some examples. So green, green space or outdoor space uh, for performing arts uh, or sculpture, having great volume of space, uh, slop sinks as an amenity, commercial kitchen, kilns, uh, Wi-Fi uh, being connected. So these are just some things that we, we know from uh, working with arts and arts organizations. Um, in other communities as well. So continuing forward, uh, you know, let, let's us, and you can think as artist and, and as community member, what are some words or phrases that, that describe the Cook County arts community here? Diverse. Sorry, diverse, you said? Diverse. Mm -hmm. Eclectic. Eclectic. Established. Established. I'm just gonna repeat everybody. Keep going, I like this. We'll make a word cloud. Evolving. I heard poor. poor, evolving, vibrant, vibrant, long term, long term, <coughs> nature based, nature based, or nature inspired, nature inspired, struggling, mm -hmm. struggling, mm -hmm. that's a universal one. <laughs> <laughs> Starving, maybe. Yeah, starving. <laughs> right. I would offer that perhaps it's more well known than we sometimes remember or think. Mm -hmm. You know, we want to grow and oh, mm -hmm. uh, become more <coughs> an international arts destination or something along those lines. And other places that I've been in my work have been like. We want to be like Cook County. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. you're, a, you're ahead of, a step ahead of where you think you are. I yeah, think. so well known <laughs> as a well, as it, an example. It's dual. It's, it's not necessarily so much as bringing in the new art, art artists, uh, mm -hmm. which is part of this, but we have, as you may have uh, come to understand, a pretty well established based artist community here. Mm -hmm. And certainly part and parcel of all this is to lift. The fortunes of all those folks, mm -hmm. uh, and not you know that has to be probably need one, and then as we do that, create uh, the space and atmosphere and whatever that is for them, uh, new artists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that kind of looking at it from both ways, serving yeah. the the locals who are he local artists community that is already here, yeah. and then making making room for opportunities of new folks. Morning. All right, can, continue with more words if, if you think of them, but also the additional question is, what are the specific challenges and or opportunities uh, that Cook County artists have? You know, going back to yeah. what you described as, you know, only 10% of artists make their whole living as art. Mm -hmm. um, so that means most artists have some other sort of meager income. Mm -hmm. uh, and 
you know, the, the challenge of, there's a dual challenge in this area of, of businesses not having enough workers and, and workers not having a, a mm -hmm. real good job. So mm -hmm. you end up having two or three jobs, which then saps all their energy and time away yeah, from their art. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. If that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Well, I would flip it to say that there are jobs available that they can have also. You know, like anyone in Cook County can get a job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but what I'm saying is they usually need two of those yeah. or three yeah, of those. I hear you. Mm -hmm. and so to put food on the table and to live, mm -hmm. and then by the time and buy supplies. And buy supplies. Mm -hmm. By the time That's you've done all that, there's not a lot of energy mm -hmm. and time left for a lot of it, maybe less emotional energy than time. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. my yeah. contact with uh, some, some of the starving artists. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that is one of the reasons why in that economic impact study that we did, <clears throat> we learned that artists made more income from their creative pursuits after they were in a supportive environment where they could learn how to market and do their work and uh, not, then gradually over time they didn't have to hold down as many jobs. Yep, yep. There is something it was, about that. I'll repeat an interesting comment that uh, Bill Hansen uh, made at the, the opening dinner at the the other night. And, and I guess it's one that I wasn't aware of, but the, the tourism uh, associations and groups uh, have been quite, for quite a while supporting uh, musicians. You know, it's kind of a tourist venue <coughs> that have musicians playing, and I, of course I've been been a recipient of going, you know, to a bar or restaurant and having music there, and there's a little company put a couple bucks in, and I haven't fully understood how <coughs> they got paid. Well, there's there's funding for that. Mm -hmm. I just became aware. Mm -hmm. And Bill's comment was, because there's this venue and, and the steady work, it's, he's become a much better artist. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think that's it would right. be readily transferable mm -hmm. to the, you know. The other arts kind of folks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The so the, the, the revenue stream is really important. You know, how to always figure that out. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's great. Thank yeah, you. Good point. Yep. Um, yeah. You use the word opportunities, and, and I think that there is no limit to the opportunities for Cook County artists. The only limit is our ability to dream up things that we might do and then follow through to do them. Um, mm -hmm. Again, I, um, I've long thought that wouldn't it be nice to uh, develop um, a virtual space where um, we entice or market Cook County uh, artists and artistic goods by using the art of writing to draw people in and do us, I mean, this is just my dream, okay, this is just go, <laughs> the way it goes. Um, we do a serial, um, newspapers used to do serials all the time, but we, we do an ongoing story about life in the North Woods and every week there's a new, there's a new uh, piece up that people have to come back to read what's next thing happening here. And while they're there, by the way, there are all these wonderful artistic goods that they can buy on this website and uh, we just, we draw them in that way. Um, and maybe that particular iteration won't work, but um, how many of us have been to a place where we said, this place really works because someone had a good idea and then followed through despite it being nuts? Um, I was thinking about that. <laughs> well, I was, no, I was thinking oddly this morning about Lake Wobegon and uh, Prairie oh Home and Companion because of the news. That was one guy's idea, or two guys, Bill Kling and, and Garrison. Um, they created this whole thing out of the ether. And we can do that too. And, and it, it's the fact that we can do it that we have to embrace. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, build, building on that, uh, you know, <coughs> not surprising, I guess you think alike. Really. Um, this whole virtual marketplace, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we, we were talking a lot about bricks and mortar and space mm -hmm. and, and studio space and mobile spaces and. Uh, but I am also aware uh, of acquaintances that are making part of a living marketing their art through sure. interest in other areas and, and is, you know, you know, pretty close to some artists and, and 
being an artist does not necessarily mean you have any kind of technical skills or interest in posting your work mm -hmm. or any business sense on, on any of those aspects. So has that been talked about at all, about the, the whole business support, uh, sales support, uh, marketing support for artists? Mm -hmm. We certainly saw it in the goals from the cultural plan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that, that, could, that could fill a big piece, um, mm -hmm. just that whole virtual, virtual um, gallery. And an opportunity for one or two people to set everybody's uh, websites up and then create the whole virtual system. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the job creation. Yeah. And in, in keeping with Mr. Edstrom's comments, um, there is a museum software through the past perfect museum software mm -hmm. for inventory and, and, and uh, duration and registration and stuff. But you can, uh, one of the things that you can do with that software is to create a virtual museum mm -hmm. you know, using the, the, uh, the items in your collections. And, mm -hmm. and individual artists could, could do the same thing. Yeah. Use that. Uh, past perfect virtual. So cool. So there's just a tool to do to yeah, do this software. kind of work. Yeah. yeah, cool. Thank you for sharing that. Yes, Tom. In the I'd back. like to, as a working artist, I want to push back against Jim just a little bit. When okay. He said there's abs there's no limit to right. what we can do here, and yes, there is a limit to what we can do, and it's part of it <coughs> is the remoteness remoteness we have, and for someone like my business, just adding shipping costs to material is, is a big deal. It, 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 it costs me about 30% more to get materials than someone in the Twin Cities. So, but on the other side of that, I agree with Jim. So what, I guess what I want to say is that it, it, there's a lot of limits and a lot of stresses for artists working here. And so it takes, it doubles the effort that we need to do as a community like the creative economy thing is doing and coming together as a community to make something happen. So there is no limit, but it's going to take an extra effort mm -hmm. on our part to overcome our remoteness. Mm -hmm. Yep. So yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what I'm hearing is there are both challenges and opportunities, but it's just how, figuring out how to navigate. Mm -hmm. And I would say the isolation creates yeah. an opportunity as well, and that we can work on our uniqueness and, and um, be close to mm -hmm. the things that are really valued by the market, mm -hmm. and um, in a way that other communities can't. Mm -hmm. We, you know, most you know walk by our doors in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have to go that far. <laughs> yeah. So there are certain um, we characteristics the way we live that we'll still give us <laughs> yeah. advantage. Yeah. And, and I, I don't think there's any disagreement I, I, yeah. uh, between me and Tom, but yeah. I would throw up um, Enterprise Oregon which has a huge uh, foundry based bronze statue business mm -hmm. and lots of public art and it's much more remote than we are and they must have figured it out and if mm -hmm. they can figure it out even if it takes us twice as much effort, we should mm -hmm. be able to figure it out too. That, mm -hmm. that was my point. Not mm -hmm. that it's easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and I'd say a big, uh, what I'm hearing is also a big sort of opportunity or, or plus is that there is a really supportive community here to, to address those challenges. So, I mean, you all are here. There was a huge turnout yesterday and last night that, that there is, and this sort of culture of, yeah, the, I think somebody said grit or, you know, we can do this, we can figure this out. So. All right, so um, local leadership, why you all are here. Um, every every type of project, but specifically any type of physical project that takes years and, and, and fundraising and so on uh, to, to come together requires a variety of local leaders. So continuing, please. Um, 
So, you know, just as some examples, uh, how these projects come together, you know, the, the many partners um, from foundations to uh, creative communities to the counties to the city or the township, uh, philanthropies. Uh, so our list of people we always want to meet with when we're here uh, is, is no mistake. We want to meet with elected officials. We want to meet with city staff and economic uh, development pl practitioners. We want to meet with arts, creative, and cultural leaders funding finance uh, and business community. That's why we have these um, focus groups, because we want to learn from you and, and, and also give a forum for, for you all to put your th ideas and thoughts together. And it may be towards a facility project, but I'm also the, I love the, these sort of the mobile ideas and the digital ideas that um, can come out of these conversations as well. So um, just a, a a, a kind of a broader conversation about project partners or and leadership groups um, in 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 the idea of what could make a physical sort of arts facility or affordable housing project uh, or whatever the concept ends up being. What are the types of partnerships that you think, um, specifically in Cook County, would would make um, make a project successful? And also, are there other local leaders or yeah. groups that you think, oh, definitely bring them into the fold if we haven't already? Um, so, just again, conversation from you guys. Any ideas on this front? Is there anybody, when, as you kind of look around, that you're seeing isn't here and you want to make sure we've talked to? The school. The school. Mm -hmm. We've certainly spoken with the arts teachers and anybody from the school here today? Last night. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The banks. Banks. The Grand Portage community. The Grand Portage community, yep. Someone else that isn't in the room are uh, some of our uh, seasonal residents who <coughs> come with a lot of resources and a, and a love for the community, um, but they're not here either. Because mm -hmm. it's not their season. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What? No, exactly. Late November? But, isn't but yeah. yet they, you know, they certainly benefit from mm -hmm. this kind of activity. Yeah. So that's a yeah. So people and this, uh, this as an example, so as as any project moves forward, figuring out how to bring them into the conversation as well. Well, pretty quick. Well, it's a seasonal residence. That's right. Yeah. Founder of Arts here. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. Cool. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh. oh, go ahead. Naysayers. Naysayers. Yes. Oh. It sounds like someone who works in the <laughs> city council. Uh, yeah, and we've you know we. Uh, are always sort of ready to, to hear from from naysayers, especially in this early process. But um, I think bringing bringing people in yeah, early. You might want to characterize it a little different. Because, um, you know, you're getting in, in all these uh, activities you're posting here. You're getting the uh, proponents of art. Uh, is, yeah. You know, I wouldn't characterize others as naysayers, but just, you know, the rest of the community. Uh -huh. um, and I think North House, you know, sees this some too. Uh, you, you really need to be um, very out there, invitational, to make sure you're not leaving leaving out and, and leaving by the wayside. And, mm -hmm. and somebody else mentioned it too about, uh, you know, well, it has to do with the history and what's been here before. So, so, you know, as we build the arts economy mm -hmm. and, and move forward, we have to make sure that we're, we're trying to bring other people along in what's going on mm -hmm. in a constructive way and not, not a naysaying way. Mm -hmm. you know, you know, keep, keep it positive, in other words. Yeah, keep it positive. Yeah. So, and <clears throat> on behalf of the naysayers, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so they're not un unrepresented. Uh, let, let me just throw out a couple of things. Yeah. Um, anything is possible, but not everything's probable. And one person's partnership can be another person's entangling alliance. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Yeah, one, two, yeah. Uh, we have a like a growing, um, I don't know, well, we have a recre a really strong recreation community, and in particular, um, I think a growing bikes and trails and stuff committee, and I know that biking and goes along with 
beer, which goes along with art. <laughs> Bikes, beer, and art. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. in other parts of the county who don't see a direct relationship between art and their business, but because art is such a huge part of our whole county image, it really does influence the draw that, they, mm -hmm. that comes mm -hmm. to make use, and mm -hmm. there may be a need to make them more aware of mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. and how something like this would benefit them, and that gets back also to Jerry's comment that it really is the whole county, mm -hmm. the art, just this mm -hmm. one of the town, and that's huge to make anything go forward. Yeah. I've, I've, that's something that is sort of one of my takeaways over the past few days about how there is really a strong county identity um, and, and a, a regional aspect to everything, all the conversations we've had. So thank you. Any other thoughts with this? Any other ideas? Yeah? I looked up the North, North Lund Foundation they are, CDFI. Oh. Yeah. Mm. So that means they do low interest loans to businesses and nonprofits. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and they're a hundred miles away. Yeah. And but they're, they're part. But they're in the service area. Yeah. Yeah. And they're they're always yeah. been board members who live here. Yeah. And they they yeah. but um, the other what are oh, there I see you have they're also um. One of those McKnight right. Oh. They're invited to come to the funders meeting today and the response that I received from the person who lives here that's on their board said that um, arts is in one of their focus areas, housing is, so we might be able to loop them into the conversation if we get to that kind of a project, but um, it's more um, children and seniors and housing are more their focus areas. Yeah. But um, there's another coming opportunity, I think, to loop some other people in because um, some of us have been involved with, with Mike and the city on talking with MnDOT about the uh, reconstruction of Highway 61 in 2019. And the latest design allows for the possibility, at least, of a, a significant public art and uh, um, other enhancements that would um, bring the artistic element into mm -hmm. a larger community discussion about something as prosaic as uh, a highway. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I didn't even think of that. Great. All right. All right. So we've just con con continuing on, of course, this conversation can continue to swirl, but um, getting into funding and financing because we're kind of tiptoeing around there now. Um, just to start talking about how some examples of uh, how these projects or arts-based projects have come together to get your mind working. <laughs> come on. All right. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay. So first, um, we want to. We, this came up in conversation yesterday. So we wanted to make sure we pulled the numbers, especially for you core group members. We we brought up this conversation about, um, you know, affordable housing and if uh, low income housing tax credits are used for a project for a housing project uh, to create this type of affordable housing. Uh, it really focuses on uh, folks who are in 30% to 60% of the area median income. And so it came up in Cook County, what is that income? What is that percentage? So for, um, we pulled the numbers, so this is 60% of area median income uh, within Cook County, um, a household size of one. Uh, the median income is uh, 20, about 27 uh, and a half thousand, <coughs> excuse me, and then goes up to a household size of four would be 39,000 dollars uh, annually. So then with afford the affordable housing uh, tax credit program, uh, the rent, there's also a rent limit and uh, a range of how much can be charged for these types of uh, units. So uh, with that range of 30% um, of area median income to 60% of area median income, the rental uh, monthly rental rates uh, are also on that sort of sliding scale for a 30% AMI unit. Uh, an efficiency uh, unit for living and working would be uh, $343 a month for a person or a family that uh, income qualifies at 60% of area median income. Uh, for an efficiency unit, it would be $687 a month. So it's a lot of numbers I know on this. Does this make sense? Are there questions? 
This um, for the uh, on Novaco, does this? I think that does not include utilities. Yeah. And for the art space um, projects that we create, we don't typically just go right up to the max suite. This, this is the ceiling, and it's typically a bit below that. Mm -hmm. This is the fiscal model that is based upon the park for the liberal space that you guys build out. So, mm -hmm. so yes. So with um, with the projects that the live work projects that we develop only on the residential side. On the residential side. Not on the studio. Exactly. Side, the exactly. Only just the live. Yep. Just the for the the residential sp um, spaces. Um, if this program, the low income housing tax credit program, is used, these are the rent uh, limit, income and rent limits set by HUD. So these are federal numbers, right? Uh, so if that source of funding is used, then this is sort of the what you need to comply with, and that's what ArtSpace typically uses for our housing projects. If you don't use those that that funding source, then um, then it's uh, you know the, the you can set whatever rents you want. Um, but art space and nonprofit, of course, the the mission is uh, affordable rents. Any other questions? So this is again just the residential side. So if we're talking about kind of the art space model, the mixed use uh, facility where it's living above, that's what this would apply to for the commercial spaces, for the business spaces, for the art studio, anything that's non-residential, this doesn't apply at all. There's no income limitation. So how does your basic finance for mm -hmm. So for so continuing oh, no. for. HUD sets the rents. Oh, oh sorry, I didn't. And HUD is not the how? source of the revenue. We'll, we'll go into that in just the next slide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Just to clarify that, mm -hmm. um, so you're saying that for four people at area medium income here in Cook County is sixty-five thousand four hundred. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So that's the median. Yeah. For for a household of four. Right. Or like what you guys? Yeah. So that's the price. Mm -hmm. The Twin County Cities is yeah. about 79,000, just as a yeah. comparison. Mm -hmm. What's the source of that number? It's Novoco.com. Um, it's where we get Novogratic, who pulls together all the. Calculated? Yeah, it's calculated by the county. But how do they know? How do they gather the data? It's a, it's a resource that's nationally, know, nationally used for um, affordable housing. And it's based on, uh, I don't know how they gather the data exactly, but it's the, it's the known resource that you use to um, look up by county. Census, how much census data probably? Probably census data, yeah. yeah. And they also use HUD yeah. figures. It's the same source as HUD would use, so those numbers would be the same. But do you know, if anybody thinks about, do you know anyone who was involved in the census or anyone from HUD? Have you ever talked to anyone or given them any information? How in the heck would they have any good information from Cook County? Yes. 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 The census was 2010. Yeah. 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 It's your tax, 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 tax returns. That's how they assess it. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's a credible source, and, and 65.4 is a median. It doesn't say, it's, all it says is half or above and half or below. It doesn't say how far below and above. Exactly. Yes, it exactly. We, we, it, it, statistics are, are here misunderstood and used badly. Mm. Um, <laughs> they really are. Mm. It's it's just it's a formula. It's used for publicly available data. It's it's, yeah, it's thank data you. that's collected thank when you. people are applying for social programs. It's it's data that it's that people are reporting, and it's used to set limits on stuff that is that is. Income qualified. Mm -hmm. So there's no reason to really second guess these numbers. And the 65 people say, well, that, that's ridiculous. Well, it's not ridiculous because there's people that are really, really, really wealthy that have this too, right? Yeah. And that draws yeah. a median up. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And 65 is the middle one. But I do yeah. think that that's tricky then when we are. I mean, I am glad to have this number. It's that I've never seen this number and I haven't heard. I feel like this is higher than what I've heard when talking to people. And obviously we need statistics yeah. and not just personal well, information. Yeah. But it is it's really challenging then when we are thinking about artists who tend to be at the lower end and mm -hmm. we're using this number that is skewed by people who have high income. But having this number this yeah. high means that more people qualify. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, yeah, understand there's lots of different that. ways that this works. Exactly. Mm -hmm. If exactly. this number was significantly lower, anybody above 32,000 would qualify. 
Um, so, so this this it's a it's a it's a guide and it and it is what it is. Um, you're you're not going to change the rules. If you want to use the programs and follow the rules, they're going to use the, the statistics that they use. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Also, we're showing you the 60 percent AMI number right. here, and this program, the Low Income Housing Tax Credit, supports 30 to 60. So the 30 percent number would be a lot lower than that. 13,000. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but then, but then they would still the thirty percent of their max rent. So if they made thirteen thousand. You're saying they would still pay three hundred and forty-three dollars. No. That's the goal. The, the unfortunate use of statistics currently in this community is kind of an argument that says we should plan to meet the lowest common denominator, and that's not how we're going to create a sustainable community. Um, if we if we really want to identify what's the lowest possible household income and plan so that that's what everybody gets to, that's what we will get to. <laughs> it's not hard to go there. <laughs> but I but I don't think that's what really what anybody is intending Desire. to say. But that's what some of the arguments tend to lead to. Uh, mm -hmm. okay. yeah. We didn't know how charged this particular slide. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I can show you a video from Monday night. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, that's good. And I think it's a good yeah, point to say too that it's it's median and not average. So perhaps I'm I'm not sure what the average is, but the, it would it'd likely be different. Yeah. I mean, I'd say in terms of the charge nature, I'd approach it differently. <clears throat> we're a pretty visionary community in my mind, and we're pretty damn pragmatic. That's how you fill the woodshed. Yeah. You know. <laughs> so and this group is exactly yeah. that. And so surprise, surprise, the numbers matter. Sure, yeah, sure. And if yeah. we don't all understand the numbers together, yeah. we're screwed. Yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. surprised you didn't know yeah. the numbers. Well, it's how long have we been talking about yeah. housing as a mm -hmm. business community? Well, we yeah. Yeah. Don't know Forever. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Why yeah. have we not <laughs> fixed it? Yeah. That's why we haven't fixed it. Because and was, where's the money coming from? Right. And, and I had that question in my mind, and that's why we're talking about this slide. Uh -huh. Because we all understand that the lack of funding to do some of these things is one of the primary challenges. Mm -hmm. The reason why we've talked about this for 40 or 50 years right. and not actually something. Yeah. Tom, Tom identified a signal. One of the reasons why the cost is higher here, the cost of materials is higher here. Two, because of the formation of geology, the cost of improvements in infrastructure is significantly mm -hmm. higher here. So mm -hmm. those two things working together make any construction Construction costs are higher. Well, there, there is another uh, element that may skew this. It won't change the figures okay. that feds use, but we have a higher percentage of people drawing under income, um, retirement income, investment income, because we have a much larger segment over 65. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so the median income here um, probably doesn't well reflect earned income. The earned income figure would be lower, I would suggest. We also have business owners. So business owners, some of them show an incredibly low mm -hmm. income, and it's mm -hmm. not a reality because of the write-offs. Mm -hmm. You know, before I was elected, my income with a family of four was less than ten thousand a year on the tax return that these people use for their configurations. Mm -hmm. So, <coughs> business owner. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. So, so part of the reason we, we bring this up is because of this uh, low-income housing tax credit tool that we often use as a source of funding is such a big part. If we can go to the next slide, please. Um, all right. That's all right. Um, that uh, it is such a large portion of the pro uh, projects we, uh, we're, we've been able to create, and this is how we fund affordable housing and affordable spaces, um, has been par partly through this low-income housing tax credit program. And this example from Hastings, our, our new project, newest project in Minnesota, um, is, is quite phenomenal how much funding we were ap actually able to get through this program. We were able to, um, to fund 83.8 percent of the entire project budget, uh, which was a 12.5 billion dollar project, through this program. Um, this is unusual. It's usually around 60 percent of the stack. So 83 percent is just the low-income housing tax credits. We'll send this to you. You don't have to write down all the numbers. Yeah. Uh, because Dakota County has its own allocation of tax credits, and they didn't have another project. We were in the right place at the right time, and we got the full allocation of tax credits. Uh-oh. Oh, no. All right. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. 
Um, that happens during Tony Board years, too. Does it really? Uh, does it? <laughs> ah. <laughs> Ta-da. Yeah. So the sort of typical stack um, for an art space project would be if we divide it between public sources and private sources, it's usually about 80% public sources of various types and 20% private sources. Uh, this one, uh, you know, most of the public sources came from the tax credits. Uh, then we supplement it with home funding, uh, deed funding, and then um, uh, also met council for, uh, this is for the brownfield. So, oops, sorry, we're back on Jackson Flats. Can we go back to, I was going to say, this is, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How does your credit? Wendy's much better at explaining that than me. So I'm like, well, I'll just take a break. <laughs> just a few more times. Yeah. But is anyone else here an expert at low income housing tax credits? Um, so this is a program that was started by Congress in 1986. It's not on the chopping block, by the way. Uh, it, there's a 4% credit that's on the chopping block, but not the 9% credit. And I know that's getting really, really technical here. But both of these projects were, were funded through 9% low-income housing tax credits. So the tax credit program is set up like this. Um, the, the, the government issues tax credits that then can be purchased by private investors. And they purchase those tax credits as a, a means of getting a credit on their tax returns for the dollars that they've invested in social impact projects. So they will buy these credits for anywhere between, right now, anywhere between 90 cents and a dollar five, for example. In New York City, it would be maybe even higher, a dollar 10. But in a community like this, it might be between 85 cents and a dollar. So the investors need that tax, passive tax loss and they get to take that for investing in projects that have a larger social impact. And this program was set up by Congress in 1986 and has been going ever since. It's bipartisan supported. So, so to um, art space that looks like a grant then? It is a grant, yeah. exactly, yep. They are not paid back. They retire at the end of a 15 year period of time and then after that 15 year period of time, we typically refinance either with another allocation of tax credits or another mortgage uh, to continue to keep those rents uh, below market rate. Does that make sense? Um, I'm trying to follow it. Um, <laughs> it doesn't sound like it's a very it technical sound thing. Like it sounds it's like a loan you don't pay back and then you it's have not. to refinance. It, it, they invest in a limited partnership. Exactly. And it generates a loss. But because they're a limited partnership, it's capped in how much they can actually but take. But the capital is put in there, the capital just doesn't go so away. So they take their initial investors in that create yeah. the partnership. So you're buy buying in. down, are you buying down that capital at the more time? They're taking that loss on their tax returns over a period of 15 years. Yep. But I mean, at the end of 15 years, where is the $10 million? end up? Is that, have you written part of that down? It's all been utilized and passed the, the, the Okay, so that, yeah. so that over 15 years, 10 million. It does not have to be paid back. Yeah. No. Yeah, so then what, what's this refinancing after 15 years? So, so the sort of counter example that might help illustrate this is a lot of other developers and for-profit developers yes. can use this program as well. And oftentimes at the end of 15 years, it just means they're free of, of compliance that it needs to stay affordable. So oftentimes developers will then sell the buildings on or kind of flip okay. it if it's so rules the rules go away with the yeah. And at, at the end of the 15 years, you also need some, there's all, usually some uh, physical improvements that need to be made to the building That's again. So you, you exactly, okay. exactly. Yeah. 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 Our space is relatively unique in that we continue to refinance because it's, um, it's not going to be sold. It's not going right. to be sold at market rate. But part of the reason I'm asking yeah. these questions is no, because good. you know we are involved in trying to do other things in the community and um, just you know, kind of think if this is a Oh, but tool, but, yeah. Well, this is a program that uh -huh. you that you have not used much in Cook done. County, right. at, at least in recent years, and according to Mary. So um, she's shaking her head that that yeah, is the no. case. Yeah. And so it might be an opportunity for you. It might be a, a nice opportunity because the state likes to invest around the state and spread out their resources oh, and away from the metro areas. So 
you know, this could be a timely opportunity for you all to pursue this program. Yep. Are there any restrictions? There's the income restrictions, of course. Well, we figured out we had to do a legislative change last year because one of the stipulations on funding was that it couldn't go to a community of less than 5,000 people, which eliminated the whole county. Uh, that is not the case with the, this Good. program. Yeah, there's also historic tax credits, which you probably also use. Now, they, the federal historic tax credits and the state tax credits are potentially on the chopping block, so. Those aren't vehicles that I've heard talked about. We're doing taxing, we're financing, we're doing that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and bonding, but I haven't heard of this program right. in our discussion. Do you use the historic tax credits here? No. We have not. No. Okay. That's and it's not showing up in this stack because this was a new build in Hastings, is yeah. new construction. Yeah. But whenever we do a historic renovation, we look to use the historic tax credits. Also, this piece, the philanthropic piece, is more typically 10 to 15% of the total project cost. But once these projects are properly capitalized, we don't go back to any of the funders and say, hey, we need a little bit more money. So that is a nice thing to be able to say after doing this 46 times. Um, so sometimes, for example, you know, the, the local arts organizations are a little worried, oh, this project is going to tap my funders. It's only tapping it for the capital, but there's no operating support for these projects. The rents have to cover the operations. And that's why there's not a lot of debt. You yeah. can't take on a lot of debt yeah. and cover the operations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, if you just jump on into I'm going to back away from you now. <laughs> sure. Thank you. Yeah. No, this is, this is good. And I'll also say in the, sort of the forthcoming report, we have some more information about the tax credit program and a little infographic. So there'll be more information following up. All oh, right. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. So you're saying we haven't really used that because we're too small. That's kind of the general feeling of the room. That county's not large enough. No. I think that's a difference. Too high for us to qualify for. Well, I thought it was numbers because people were saying like over five thousand, which is why that was a different program. That was a different program that we yeah. had to work with the legislators. Thank you to the chamber and other people that were able to get the language changed so that we qualified. So, um, and we have HUD dollars coming in our projects with one room. Yeah, but well, not tax credits. It's different. There's all kinds of different programs. Right, right, right. Through, through the I was just curious, okay. just real quickly, then it, USDA tends to be more of the rural funder, right? Mm -hmm. Then mm -hmm. in that mm -hmm. case, so do, does USDA ever offer more tax credit incentive type stuff? They're more grant focused. The USDA. Um, we have a grant, for example, for the Pine Ridge project from the USDA. Um, and we anticipate we will in Colorado for our rural work. So um, it's not a tax credit, but there are grant programs that can be used for projects like this. Yeah. And we're eligible for those programs. We just haven't tapped into them yet because yeah. we're just starting down this path. Yeah. So. So yeah. One, one, one grant area the USDA is very active in is uh, developing cooperatives, uh, rural cooperatives. Um, and they don't have to be butter cooperatives. I mean, could be an arts cooperative or something like that. They're, they're, there are fairly fulsome uh, grants available to do that. Right. And it's kind of present to this. Just if there's any other other potential funding sources that you that we haven't discussed, um, you know. We've been working in the state of Minnesota and in rural areas, so we have our toolbox. But if there's any like very local sources that you think we might not have thought about yet, we'd love to hear about that. We'll be asking the funder group as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. USDA rural uh, loan program came too. Right. That thing that you had at, at North House School. Yeah. There was a whole. Yeah, it was just a day seminar, and there was like all these funders mm -hmm. all that showed up. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very very large group. Yeah. Funders. And they're all invited to the ten thirty meeting this yeah. morning. Yeah. Um, we didn't get much in the way of RSV fees. RSVPs <laughs> from those funding organizations, but I think this is a, and they know that this is a preliminary conversation, mm -hmm. but if and when we come around to having a project, then we'll definitely be 
reaching out to all of those sources, and yeah. whether it's art space or someone in the local community, yeah. will be knocking on those yeah. doors. <laughs> well, and we've gotten some good funding from McKnight and Blandon for, for instance, the higher ed building. I mean, I don't know what you've gotten for. I got some McKnight funding for the um, Art County Fusion in 2005. So they've been pretty helpful in different yeah. projects. Yeah, that's good. Thanks. They don't just give through the regional arts commissions. They also have been direct yeah. grant mm -hmm. tours. That's good. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's great. I heard a watch beep, so I want to be respectful of time. It's 10 o'clock, which is when we're scheduled to end. So I, I um, won't be offended if anybody needs to leave. Um, we just, just sorry, go ahead. Well, I wonder if we've tapped this group for yeah. most everything we need to at this point. I mean, we could give you a choice. We could go through um, the site criteria that we look at, or we could go through the um, overlap with other community goals. I think the overlap with the other community goals would be more, I, I, I'm not, I shouldn't speak for everyone. Alignment but. with community goals, yeah. yeah. Um, also, I can summarize the, the potential sites conversation is that there's no um, idea yeah. that, that a potential site was going to be chosen. We looked at a bunch of uh, opportunities um, to give some feedback on what might be available, but there's no um, sort of uh, search in earnest of potential sites at this point. Um, for the, yeah, yeah. If we just skip to the. So, especially with you, with you all as civic leaders, we want to just touch on the on the idea, and you're getting a, a half sheet of paper as well about um, what some. Uh, broader community goals could be for a project like this and we've written down both on the paper and on the slide it's the same uh, ideas of, of community broader community goals that these types of projects can help address and we want to know of these of these goals which which three if you could circle three uh, would be sort of goals that you that you, that you have been grappling with as an individual or your group or that you can see a project like this really helping address and of course, if there's one that we didn't think of, uh, write it in, please. Usually we have, we, if we had time, we'd have more of a discussion about this. But you know, I'll just read them out. Re increasing residential density, um, bringing more people downtown as a potential goal, goal, maintaining affordability as a goal, we've heard about, uh, preserving historic structures, or uh, uh, activating vacant lots, if you're looking for some infill, downtown revitalization in general. Uh, supporting a cultural community or a specific cultural group that um, could use more representation through the arts, um, assisting rural artists, so bringing in uh, what we've heard is that countywide effort of, of people who might be more isolated and bringing them into the, the um, sort of cultural community. Uh, Transit-oriented development uh, would be you know, train or bus lines, uh, sustaining creative businesses and nonprofits, so specifically um, working with business communities, anchoring an arts district or a cultural district, enhancing healthy lifestyles, promoting tourism. Again, these are just sort of broader goals that we've heard from other communities that, with, that our projects have sort of worked with. And as we've found working across the country, the more goals we can layer on top of each other, the more uh, successful these projects can be, the more funding opportunities there are, uh, the more um, people can can engage with it, so it's not just an art for art's sake um, project, but it's addressing other needs. Perhaps it's education, perhaps it's um, health and wellness, aging in place, whatever it may be. Um, so th we've seen the side, but uh, we the uh, Pine Ridge project that we're doing, uh, really that goal was supporting a cultural community. The funders were really interested in supporting the uh, Og Ogallala Lakota artists. Uh, as a different example, this is Loveland, Colorado. We were really called in initially because this building was um, on, you know, on the verge of being torn down. So this beautiful historic uh, feed and grain building, uh, we got the call, can you do something with this? Can, there's a big arts community here. Could you um, say, help us save this building? And we said, well, let's not start with the building. Let's figure out all the other pieces. Uh, and it came out that housing was such a big need in Loveland as well. Uh, and we had this building is not suited for housing. so. But there was a vacant lot next door, so we were able to do new construction 
live work housing, affordable housing for the artists. And this uh, is phase two, which will be an arts incubator for um, organizations and businesses. So two major community goals, which was uh, sustaining the creative businesses and the nonprofits, and then preserving this historic building. Okay, so circling your top three priorities, because I know some of you need to go. Um, I will just also say, kind of the summary slide. We're gonna collect these papers, and we would love to get your input. Also, if there's another kind of comment that you didn't get to say, feel free to write it on there. Uh, we also wanna just let you know what happens next. So we'll go back to Minneapolis this afternoon uh, and put our notes together, write a report with all our findings, give some recommended next steps, what to, where to go from here, uh, and then additional information about uh, about those paths as well. Uh, we'll deliver the report in, in January, hoping they'll be finalized uh, after a couple back and forths, making sure we get all the facts right, uh, and then um, then that, that information is yours and we'll continue to the conversation to see how art space might stay involved um, in further work. So thank you for your time. Sorry I'm talking uh, double speed now, but um, if you have any sort of double speed, double speed, um, if you have any comments or questions, feel free to you know, come up and chat afterwards. We've got a little bit of time uh, in between focus groups. So. Thanks again. This was great. Great, great information. Thank you.